Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Cincinnati. Um, we can, you can stop me anytime, put your hand up if I don't see you, just yell at me. I tend to like to move around, and unfortunately, I had props, and I walked into the room and I realized they will not project very well, so I'm sorry about that. I should have planned for a bigger audience, um, but we'll just talk through everything today. Does anybody know where this is? <laughs> where? That's exactly right. Main entrance of Bernard. So that's what it can look like if you're looking through a really, really, if you're either not corrected, so if you're nearsighted, farsighted, really, really bad astigmat, but that would be more warped in that case, or if you have a cataract, or God forbid if there's a detachment and you're way out of focus. So there are many different things. You guys could recognize it because it was something that was relatable to you, but if you'd never been here before, you'd It'd just be a blur. And so just a quick anatomy of the eye, and I, um, I try not to put too many pictures in here because sometimes I know eyes make people queasy, so I um, was trying to avoid any, any of that. So, you know, just looking at the eye front to back, and I'll probably, am I okay to move around, guys? Step around and just point out a few important things here. So, you know, things, we, things you always talk about, we're talking about the retina and the choroid, this right here is probably the most important if you're talking about important part of your eye. Everything is important. But there it's where you get your best vision. So we recently had um, an eclipse and everybody was saying get the right glasses, you could burn off your retina. That was the part you were going to burn off if you have a fovea and you foveate and you're looking at anything. And once you lose central vision, it's <coughs> impossible almost to get back. And um, so front to back. And if you think about the eye when in week seven, and I'm probably going ahead, the eye closes like that when it's forming. So top to bottom. And um, I just put this up here so you can see what the optic nerve looks like and what the fovea looks like because there'll be other pictures down the line where we show colobomas and um, what the anatomic differences can be. And this just shows, and I put this in here just really to emphasize that vision is not just what you can see. Vision is also what your brain will let you see. So um, I'm particularly detail-oriented, so I refract myself and my technicians run because I will go, no, no, it's a little bit off, no, no. But, you know, like some people's brains are 2010, they can see high detail, and some people can never get to 2020, and some people, you look at them and you say, how can you even function and see so well without your glasses, because you're a minus, whatever, and some other people will scream if they're off by a quarter diopter, that's probably me. But vision is more than just what you know, your eyes can collect is also what your brain interprets and the, in, the back and forth between that. So if anybody in here has ever been sick enough that you actually saw two or everything was blurry, you know, God forbid, horrible nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you're dehydrated and your brain can't keep up. Um, you know, our chargers sometimes have seizures and you notice that in that period they're not interacting visually the way we expect them to because the electric activity in the brain is so altered at that point in time, they can't really communicate visually. So it's, it's more than just what the eyes see. And so what are the findings we see in charge? And um, I'm given a brief overview of almost everything, but sort of a lot of the things I see big time in my clinic that come in with different questions, so stop me at any time. So really early in life, nasolacrimal duct obstruction is a very common thing we see in children. And it's characterized by this constant tearing or intermittent tearing, depending on if it's a full obstruction or a partial obstruction. So some parents will say, when my child has a cold, his eyes or her eyes tear, but when, when they're not, when they're otherwise fine, or sometimes it's just there all the time. Oftentimes we like to wait till the child is at least the year of age one before we do anything. Now if a child has other concomitant things that need anesthesia, will join with that other team, but we primarily wouldn't take a child for this in the absence of infection. So a child gets a really swollen puffy eyelids because they're in really red injected conjunctiva because they have a blocked tear duct. We'll treat that with antibiotics and take them because when they're young, anything can cause sepsis really early. But outside of that, we just watch. Um, I tend to, when I take these in my chargers and um, trisomy 21 or some other craniofacial changes to always put a stent in there. 
when you're opening up, when you're doing the probing, because I find that these patients have a high propensity of recurrence. So they'll look good for one to two weeks and they'll come back. And then that's another anesthetic. So put a probe in, just go ahead and put a stent. So if a lot of times, I know all of you don't come to children's for care, but if you're doing that, go ahead and stent. The other thing I found in some of my charges is the fact that when you get intraoperatively, they may not actually have a punctum for you to go into. And so that's one thing, and I'm probably going to jump around here. That's one thing that I always like to try and look for before surgery so that I'm not under anesthesia if I'm the only one going to take them. And then suddenly, part of the reason we're here is, well, we can't do it. So if that's the case, I then go in with the oculoplastic surgeon who can create a new pathway for me and do something different, so just something else to think about. And I've had some charges who have them up above and not down below, but once I have something, I can go through. So cranial nerve 7 palsies, you know, it can cause a decrease or complete incomplete blink on the affected side or sides. It can be unilateral or bilateral. Um, the concern there is it results in conjunctival and corneal dryness. So if everybody's up for it, we all play the staring game and who can't blink. But if you stare a really, really long time and everybody's rate is different, you actually realize, and if you're bored or if you're in a meeting and you're really trying to entertain yourself, keep your eyes open a really long time and you actually start to notice the other person or whoever you're looking at goes out of focus. And that's why, that's the reflex for which we blink. The reason that happens is the biggest refractions are the eyes, we, the way the eyes work is it collects ray, rays of light, so it hits that, oh sorry guys, where it hits the cornea and it hits the tear film, that's where we get our biggest refraction. So a lot of people think it's inside with a lens, but you get 45% of your refractive correction right there. So if you're dry, you're going to go out of focus. So we want, our chart, we want all our patients to see well, but if they're like this and they can't blink because the cranial nerve servant that serves for that feedback to tell you to blink that you're dry is not there, you're just getting there and dry and dry and dry and dry. And um, for anybody in the room who's ever had LASIK, one of the big things is the dryness because you're actually severing off all those nerves, so dry eyes are very uncomfortable actually. The other concern is if it stays dry for a really long time, you have little micro abrasions in the cornea and then they can become big abrasions and you can get an infection. And some of those can be very difficult to treat because even as you're treating the infection, the reason why it was caused is not treated, so you kind of end up in the cycle. And um, we don't like that. So treatment, we try to be preventative if possible, lubrication, 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 lubrication. If that's not possible or if that's not enough, we do punctal occlusion. Sometimes there's a small plastic silicone rod can fit in there. And sometimes we do it with thermal cautery where you're completely closing that out, trying to get that punctal atresia look if it's necessary. And then some other times we talk about a temporary or permanent arsorophy. So what we do is we'll sew the eyelids together on the sides or in the middle or just leave a small window depending on what's necessary. That can be temporary if you just need the eye to heal from a recurrent infection. So sometimes you get a child in the ICU who's there for breathing or some other reason and their eyes open the whole time. And then the nurses are doing medicines every two hours, but think about how many times in a minute we naturally blink, but the child is sedated, intubated, and cannot. And you can get a bad infection that can sometimes get out of hand, and now you've got more interesting bugs than we normally have in the everyday life in the ICU, so you can get some really intense infections. So we'll close the eye so that you can at least allow for lubrication during that period and take out the sutures. Some people do need a little bit of a permanent down the road. And then the last thing we'll do is a gold weight, which we go into the eyelid and we put that in there. That way the lid stays down and the child can, or the adult can forcefully open when it's necessary. Any questions so far? Okay. So other things we'll see going forward is the microcornea. So we always talk about any child over the age of 12 months should have a corneal diameter of at least greater than 10 millimeters. So anything smaller is a smaller cornea. That does not necessarily mean that the rest of the eye is small. Sometimes you just have a smaller window. The big things with that is making sure that the refraction is correct and if the child needs to have any other in this particular photo, what you see here is this child actually has their natural lens taking out and um, they had a cataract and now they have a specialized contact. 
So in those cases, you want to make sure with altered um, changes in the front of the eye, the refraction will be different. So you're accounting for that, so they're getting enough of a clear visual access. In colobomas, which I know we hear most frequently about in charge syndrome. So colobomas come from a Greek word which means stopped or curtailed. And it happens and usually in the seventh week of embryogenesis and as the eye is starting to close off, if it stops somewhere, sometimes it stops in the front and that's where you get the iris. Stops a little further back, you can get the lens. A little for, further back, you can get the cord. Further back, you can get the retina. And all the way at the end, you can get that optic nerve as it's starting to close off. And what happens there is if those tissues don't come together, the natural retina tissue or lenticular tissue, whatever it is that's supposed to grow in that then doesn't have sort of its foothold for it to come into and grow. So the iris coloboma, this is a patient um, that doesn't have charge, but this is a classic picture of what that would look like. And so sometimes it's unilateral, sometimes it's bilateral, and you have that typical appearance. It's usually down and towards the nose. The big thing about these is um, if you see them, you, for us as ophthalmology, we always want to look in the whole eye to know if it was a closure that only stopped in the front or did it keep going all the way along the pathway of the eye or um, is there any light sensitivity because now they've got a little bit extra light and normally the iris will constrict if we're going to bright light and it cannot down there or do they have a refractive error because there's some altered um, for the pathway for which the light comes through. And sometimes if it's one eye over the other, you find the child may be more farsighted or more nearsighted in one eye over the other. So that's a risk factor that should always be checked for. So the lens coloboma in this photograph here, so that's the natural lens there. And those are the zonules which naturally hold it down. So that's the iris. And right now, the lens coloboma, the lens didn't form there. So these zonules are extra stretched, and the lens is higher up. So it depends on how far stretched it is. So if you can imagine with me, if I'm looking through this and my lens coloboma is down here, well, I'm not going to be bothered by that. And neither should your ophthalmologist. But if I'm looking through this and my lens coloboma sometimes is here, sometimes it's here, every time it's maybe here, I'm seeing something different than if it's here. And so then that should be a concern. The other concern would be if you suddenly dilate the patient and the lens decides to pop forward, then it's now in the wrong anatomical position, and that can be a concern. And normally, fluid flows through the eye, and we, that's why we can keep the structure of the eyeball, but you can block that fluid, and children who have these sometimes are at risk for having sudden high pressures if they stop that flow. And that will not be hard to miss. Um, it will be really red, angry, painful eye. You would, the child would get really sick to their stomach if the pressures were out of control, and you would need to go to the emergency room for that to be taken care of. Usually they're very localized in charge and they don't lead to instances like that. And the big thing again is photophobia, making sure they're corrected refractively and sometimes we'll wait as long as possible because your natural lens is better than anything else we can put in to make sure that you can still see before we try and go in and do that. And also oftentimes when there's a lens coloboma, usually the retina may be affected. So we really want to go in when it's necessary, not just because we see a change. So cataracts are things we can see in charge. Um, a cataract is just an opacification of our natural lens in the eye. It can be there either at birth. Oftentimes, if it is, the eye itself is, not, is also small with altered contents in that. And we talk about um closer to the end. It can be developmental, where it wasn't there right at birth if you screened, but you can see it later in life and then it progresses. And then in some patients, it can be acquired. And oftentimes in my practice, I've found is my patients who may have better vision in one eye over the other and sort of the rubbing stimulates vision. So if you rub and you're pushing your eye a lot, you actually get light. And some children would give themselves that photo um, stimulation. So that's a sensory feedback. And if they don't see that well out of that eye, that's something good they would do. And we want to stop that because then that can lead to affecting the retina just from when you chronically rub, you drop your pressures, they go up, and that sudden change of decompression, recompression can affect the retina, but also can cause changes in the lens and can lead to a cataract. 
I always say, I always want to protect the eye as long as possible because I never know what is coming down the line and what I, what I may not have a fix for today, somebody smarter than me may be fixing and then if I have a, an eye I can put it into you in the future then that's great rather than not having one. And so in terms of if there's a cataract, it really depends on where it is. If I'm looking through here and my cataract is here, I wouldn't touch it. If I'm looking through here and my cataract is right here in the middle, then I would. So the, the, the thing with children is if it's greater than three millimeters, because most children dilate to about three millimeters in the middle of the visual axis, that's when we go after it. So in this particular photo, there's a small one down here that we would just watch. And that eye is microphthalmic. So optic nerve coabomas. So here in this photograph, we see the excavation or the area where it didn't completely close off. And up above, you can see the rest of the um, optic nerve tissue. And this photograph just shows only an optic nerve coloboma. It doesn't show any association with the retina. Oftentimes in charge, sometimes you get just the optic nerve coloboma, but oftentimes there's a core retinal coloboma that comes with it. And so in this photograph here, you can see the optic nerve. I'm sorry, guys, on this side, do you see what I'm pointing out over here? Okay. And you can see the cororetinal coloboma down below. And then, so what, what happened here is the eye started to close off and stop there, and the retina tissue started to come in, but didn't have a scaffold in to come into here. So we see the choroid, which is the layer under the retina. We see those vessels in that. Oftentimes these are inferior because again, how the eye closes. I always look when I'm evaluating anybody with a coloboma. Does it involve the optic nerve? That's really important for me to know. Does it involve the macula, which is where we get our best vision? And does it involve the fovea, which is where we get our high, high detailed vision? Because if there's a coloboma that is down inferiorly and out of the visual axis, there will be a visual field defect, but it will probably not be clinically significant versus one right in the middle. And so in this photograph, this is a much larger coloboma. Right there in the middle is where the optic nerve was. There's a little bit of scar tissue and there's even some other areas in there. You can see the rest of it. So clinically for me, what's most difficult is trying to get way down there to see. So sometimes, you know, if you've been in my clinic, we're holding toys all the way down and I'm trying to see it all the way down because if I can get a look 360 degrees around and I can see where the retina meets the core, where the retina meets the coloboma and I don't see any breaks or tears, then I feel much more comfortable versus if I can't see all the way around. If I'm not able to see around because dilation is just not pleasant and our exams are long and our patients are tired and when you guys come to children's, thank you for your patience because we put you through the ringer and then we've got this eye exam. Um, then we'll try and see if we can join in if the child is scheduled for another procedure. That way we can see all the way around and if necessary, take photographs. And sometimes this will change. And so like in these colobomas, what we see here is this is very localized, this is down below, this is the optic nerve and it's just off the photograph, but that would be where your macula is and down there would be where your fovea is. So this patient, whenever they're old enough and can cooperate, Corporate, you'd find a visual field defect that's probably right there, but would probably never bother them because even when we all go to look up, none of us really does that. We all, that's natural. We all always go up, so you always sort of avoid it, and that would never be an issue. Here, this is a little bit of a larger one, but again, the optic nerve is further up. As opposed to in this photograph, you can see the optic nerve is involved and also some of the core retina around, but they get that right there would be where your fovea is and it just misses it. So if you did a visual field defect, you get this area and then it come really close to the visual axis, but it wasn't involved. And so sometimes you have patients who've come in and they have the positive diagnosis and they've been told their eyes are perfectly healthy and oftentimes that's actually right. And I'll take a look and I'll see a little tiny person like that which may have been missed, but that's actually a form through coloboma. So it started, but didn't quite happen. It's starting to close and just the last minute didn't close, sort of. And, and, but, but you know, that's okay. 
but you can see those. And I've had a couple of patients who've come in and I think I've had to say, I see a small one and my parents get anxious. I say, no, it's form first, almost, almost happened but didn't. And you'd have to do a really, really high, high, high grade um, visual field to find that and that never bothers. And so the location really determines the visual implication. How big it is will determine how big a visual field defect is. And it can result in refractive errors. So that area of the coloboma makes the eye a little bit longer. So you need to know where the child is using for vision because you can get very, very near sighted prescription. And if you're just a little bit off into the rest of the retina, they can be very, very far sighted depending on what you're getting. And so you can sort of be in the middle of both things. So it's always good if the child is awake to see if they'll look at a toy. So you kind of know where they're using to see. If you cannot see a defined fovea, that you can say, ah, this is where Jamie uses when he views things. So when you have these areas of visual deprivation, it can lead to strabismus, which I didn't go into in this, but where there's a misalignment of the eyes. So the eyes can either turn in or the eyes can turn out. Oftentimes, when you get that, it's sometimes a sensory response. Either one eye has a much larger coloboma, and so the brain ignores it, and the eye goes very much in or very much out. But occasionally, you have a child who you look at and who just looks just a little bit out. Sometimes I don't touch those, because if I look inside, I may see a coloboma, and I may see the fulvia right there, just right on the edge. So he or she has learned just to be a little bit out to get that fine detail. And the beautiful thing about the eye is our retinal nerve fibers, we can have one or two left over and you can still get really high detail vision. We know that from our adult glaucoma patients, we look at their optic nerve and you think, well, that nerve is pale and that nerve has lost all its microfibers. And you can even measure that with some testing and this patient will tell you 20-20. You know, they've got this tiny island they see through but they've got it and they use it. And so sometimes our patients with coloretinal colobomas, even though what we look at may not explain how well they see, I always say I never judge. I can make predictions of vision, but I never make guarantees based upon what I see. So one thing I'll never tell a parent when the child is first born or in the ICU or early is, well, they'll never see you or anything like that, because that's not true, because you never know what they're going to use to learn to use with. And I've been very pleased with some of my patients, because you anatomically look at them, but they do so much better, because they find somewhere else to use as a viewing area. So Lucy was kind enough to tell me that retinal detachments are definitely a concern and something that we wanted to address today. And so some of these numbers may look alarming, and these are, there's not a lot of data out there. So the largest population of patients that have been confirmed, CHD7, was 19 patients. Prior to that, there was a paper in 1990, and he did look at some of that, but also was using the old criteria for charge. So there's not a lot of data where you use either the new criteria or you have confirmed genetic diagnosis of charge where you can say, okay, I have this number of patients, and based upon this, I can give you an incidence of how many patients have this, 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 and this. So some of it is just looking at all pediatric retinal detachment cases and then extrapolating coloboma test changes, which are not always charge related from that. And so we do know that any eye with a coloboma is at an increased risk for retinal detachment because when you have that area of the retina coming up to this area that is missing, there's not a tight adhesion for it to hold on to. So there are a number of different types of retinal detachments. One is what we call a regmatogenous retinal detachment, where the retina just pulls up for different reasons. Sometimes it's trauma, sometimes it's just a weak link that you have there, and sometimes it's right from birth it's already been a, a weak area and then over time it's just like stretching a rubber band eventually it sort of starts to break apart with those in terms in general of any coloboma related to pediatric retinal detachments it's 0.5 percent of all pediatric retina detachments so that's actually a really low number but when you have the optic nerve involved with that, when you're looking at that 0.5%, that number can be as high as 45%. And that's why I put the asterisk up there saying that the data really varies. And the reason being is, and I'm going to go back all the way to our first slide with the eye anatomy.
right back here, all of this is bathed in all the fluid that surrounds the brain. And so you have this constant grade of cerebrospinal fluid coming forward. Anatomically, normally there's a tight connection there so you don't have that coming into the eye and you've got these separate cavities. But when we have that coloboma, you've got that fluid that can still come through. And if it comes through, there's nothing to push it back. And you've got that area of the retina that is weak and it can then get under there through that coloboma and start to lift up the retina. So that, that connection is really what happens. So it's not the natural jelly or the vitreous in the patient that causes the detachment. It's actually fluid that comes through. Those can vary. So you may see a child today that has it and you see them six weeks later and that area is gone because the fluid is really, the gradient may, is really dependent on what's coming from the cerebrospinal fluid. So some people may watch those for six months, but if it's not gone in six months, absolutely treat. And then some other people, which we do here, if we see it and it isn't very advanced, we always put a barricade of laser around that. Mm -hmm. And so the way we treat these are one of multiple things. The laser retinopexy tends to be our first go-to. So imagine if you've got wallpaper and you've got some water behind it and you can sort of get to the wallpaper enough and glue gone or put some nails there and you stop everything and then the rest of the eye with the pumping mechanism will pull it all back. What we stop it. That's really the first thing we try to do. Sometimes if it's really, if it's a larger area, we have to go into the eye, take out all the jelly which is naturally in there, so that you can then get to the retina itself and sort of get the fluid from under it and lay it back down. Now, you don't trust the retina in any patient when you lay it back down to stay down, so we then put either air or, uh, or we put um, gas or we put silicon oil in there so that it pushes everything and keeps it down. And you hope that the pumping mechanism between the cord and the retina then sticks it down. Around the area where those coloboma will oftentimes then put laser there to sort of create a barrier. And what laser does is it burns between the retina and the cord and it sort of welds it down so you can hold that down because we know it's not a tight connection. The fluid has to come out eventually. The difficulty with retinal detachments with colobomas is sometimes you take the fluid out and even intraoperatively you can see the retina is starting to come up and you have to put it back in. And so for our patients that don't live close by, sometimes we'll do oil because that can stay longer versus gas where you can't fly for a number of weeks depending on which gas we give you. Because you go too high, the gas expands, you don't want anything to happen in your eyes. So there are limitations to what we can do. Some other patients would do a scleral buckle. So the retina is weak and not really adherent. So you're going from the outside and you're sort of like giving the, the eye a hug so that the retina pushes back up if that makes um, sense and pushes back up to hold in place. So we really hope that we catch these if they're going to be present early and hopefully laser can do it. Or the biggest prayer and hope is that they don't happen. A lot of our parents will say what can we do to know if there's a difference. I say just be very vigilant to visual behaviors because those are really the key if there's a big change, especially in some of our patients who are nonverbal. So in this photograph here, this is a retinal detachment associated with the coloboma. And I know you all don't look at these very frequently, but here, if you notice the coloboma and the optic nerve are out of focus and the retina is in focus. Normally everything should be at the same plane. So if you take a photograph, you get everything in equal view, but you've got this little bit out of focus. So these blood vessels here are a little bit more in focus versus the rest back there. And that's how you know if you're not looking binocularly to get that 3D view. I, t I say that because sometimes I've gone out to tell a couple of my parents that there's something and that's the best way to explain it when you're looking at a photograph of something you don't look at very frequently. So in this case, we'll probably get together with the retina surgeon and talk about what we're going to do best for this. Any questions? So yes, so that's the, well, the number of things with the silicone oil, it can, it can emulsify because it's oil. So sometimes you go back in and just do silicone oil exchanges. And a couple of patients that we just go in and we exchange, but we put, we take it out and we put, put it back in. 
Um, glaucoma is another concern, just because it's sitting there and there's something physically in the eye. So if silicone oil is going to stay there a long time, you want to do an inferior peripheral iridectomy because silicone oil, that's how it goes. So there's flow. But if there's already um, um, a coloboma down there, sometimes you may have a, already an area for that to communicate. So, and then it can emulsify. So then you've, you've gone against what you're trying to do. You've created another barrier. So a lot of returns to the, to the operating room if it has to stay a long time. So in, in the perfect world, we try to take, them, we try to take it out after, an, after so much time. But sometimes you may need to, um, not, not my chargers, but I have another set of patients who are self-abusive. And so they keep hitting and rubbing and rocking. Um, and we, I have some that silicone oil has been in there 10, I mean, you just go in, you take it out, and you put another in, just because every time you know that they're going to self-abuse. And, and that's why Dr. Wiley works with me very well, to help with those behaviors so we can decrease them. And we talked about microphthalmos earlier, and that's just that smaller volume of the eye. So sometimes the eye will close, but at the rate where everything is just a little bit smaller, so the cornea will be smaller. Oftentimes there'll be the iris coloboma, and if you look along the length of the pathway, you also see the lenticular changes and optic nerve changes. And sometimes really early, even as early as birth, sometimes there's a retinal detachment with that, depending on how small the eye is. So at birth, typically the eye should be anywhere between 16.75 to about 18 millimeters. And by age one, you should be larger than 20 millimeters in terms of the length of the eye. And sometimes these eyes can be as small as six to seven millimeters. So really, really far-sighted eyes. Sometimes um, we try our best to fit them to get as clear vision as possible. So sometimes it's contact lenses and glasses just to magnify things well enough. So the other question was functional vision. I know they asked me to speak slowly, but we're running out of time, so I'm going to speed up just a little bit. Um, so what, what we look for in our clinic is when the child comes in, sometimes you just watch how they walked in. Sometimes they're tired, they're in, they're in a carrier, but how do they walk in? How do they interact? Do they respond to a social smile? Do they respond to a toy? Recognize faces, or at least recognize mom, or dad, or caregiver, or anybody with them? What do they do with contrast? So it's just being able to tell the difference between a really, really dark object against a white background and not so dark, and we gradiate that, because that just lets us know how much attention you can see and how much you can vary things between rooms and be knowing that, okay, maybe you shouldn't put Johnny in a really dark room and everybody wear black, because he may not be able to tell. Maybe we should always be in a lit room with high contrast colors, like a red shirt or a yellow shirt, so he can always tell there's mom, there's dad, and anything like that. Looking for visual acuity, how best they can tell. Sometimes we're not verbal yet, but you can look to see if there's a preference between one eye or the other. Do I, does Johnny always respond better with one eye or the other? And sometimes just even covering one eye will tell you. You know, Johnny cries every time I cover one, his left eye, but not when I cover his right. Then he maybe he's not using his right and really loves his left. That's why he always cries. Looking for nystagmus, which is the shaking of the eyes. And that, can be something in the eye or something along that visual pathway we talked about, because nystagmus happens most of the time because there's some sensory feedback that doesn't come through. And then strabismus, looking for misalignment. Then looking inside the eye. So I like to know everything along the pathway so I can at least understand what the child sees. I may not be able to completely represent that, but see it along the way. Check for refraction, make sure you're correcting whatever is necessary. Sometimes I will give a child a prescription that I may not give another child of that age, depending on what their visual functional needs are, just to help them with everything they need. So some of the children can accommodate. Normally when you're two, you can accommodate 20 diopters. But if you have other things going on, you may not have the energy to do that. So getting your glasses early may be helpful. And then the other thing that came up and Lucy told us was cortical visual impairment. And so this is something that goes back to the question of how do I see? I see just what my eyes collect, but also what my brain interprets. And so we always talk about a CVI range just to know where your child is or where your patient is and how they're improving. So when they're one to two, sometimes it's very minimal visual response. And that can be I'm really tired, I'm exhausted, I just took a lot of medicines, I'm not able to engage here. So the way we sometimes explain it is think about everybody in a 100 scale. So, you know, 
for me, it maybe takes me 10 out of that for me to stand up, another 10 to keep smiling, another 10 to look. But if I have so much going on in my body or I'm just really sick and not, not doing well, it may take me 80 of those points just to even sit up. So now I have to engage with you visually and I don't have enough reserve left and I may not be able to do that. And so just knowing where they are and working with therapy. And so this is informational, I'm not going to go through that. But really treatment is dependent on what the phase is and where you are so that you know how to tailor the treatment for your patient or for your child so that you know how to engage them. Because if you understand where they are, you understand how to interact with them. And here are some of the characteristics. I should have put an asterisk here to say that this is not particularly always fair with charge because you see some of these for other reasons, but these are some things that you then have to sort and separate out to figure out what's causing what. So low vision aids, sometimes it's hats and sunglasses and just having a hand to hold on to in, a, in an unfamiliar, unfamiliar environment. Other things would do glasses, bifocals, correct a large angle strabismus because if one eye has vision but it's here and another one is here, sometimes just being able to align the images will help better. We talk about magnifiers, so the optical devices, but also video magnifiers, and then the telescope devices, so if your child has the ability, they can just look up and say, oh, mom is over there, even though ideally they may not be able to do that, or oh, there goes dad, or whatever it is they're looking at. So we try to incorporate low vision aids really early. So occupational therapy early in life, low vision help early in life, so they learn how to use their vision to the maximum early so they can gain everything they can in life early, as opposed to trying to teach you when they're older and they've not used that so much because they couldn't. And then the brain doesn't always want to use the eye. So this is just a picture of a child getting really close to get to read her books with a dome magnifier because she can see it better. Other things are orientation and mobility training with a visual field defect, you know, how to get around, especially, you know, um, new environments. An IP where the teachers understand this is what Johnny, Jamie needs in order to do well in school. And using technology, that has probably been the best thing. There's a lot of technology out there that is helpful. Um, Microsoft brought out something that will actually sort of interpret what somebody's doing in front of you. Oh, she's smiling, or she's frowning, or this is a $10 bill, things like that that are really out there to help you. And then some of the more traditional things, Braille. So if any of my patients have good functional vision, or even a little bit, I always say let's always talk about getting Braille, and think of it as learning a secondary language. So I, I speak three, but I learned English first. But when I learned everything else, nobody was trying to replace. It was just as a substitute when I was ever in a different part of the world or with different people that needed to. That's what we talk about. Like If they have good functional vision, let's use Braille sometimes as a substitute. Because sometimes you may be older and need to read so much quicker. And rather than having to use that spotter, it may just be quicker to run your fingers so you can get that information. and just keep moving on with life and cane training. It may not necessarily be that your child can get around, but in big environments, then you're protecting everybody else from coming to you so they know. So my patients get an injury, I stick a shield on them. Like, it's not for you, it's for the other kids in school. So they don't say, you're back in school, and they punch you in the eye, and you're back here again. So things like that. And then guide animals when necessary. And also just that soothing comfort. Sometimes when you're calmer and not as uncomfortable, you can actually use your vision more. Sometimes when I'm really stressed, I can see my vision going gray, and I just have to breathe. And so this is a picture, and there's so many new devices out there, but this is a picture of um, <clears throat> a transformer. And really what these does, some of them are big, some of them are small, but you can see the little girl, she can turn it down. Sometimes you can turn it up to look at the teacher, look across the room. Some of them would take photos. And so they've got this device they can carry around and really use to navigate their world. In some newer schools, there are apps you can sync into the smart board, so whatever the teacher writes on the board, instead of having to look up, it comes straight to your laptop or your computer, and you can zoom text and do everything you need. And then the Acrobat has been around a lot longer, but does the same thing. They're varying prices with these. So all in all, from my standpoint, maximize all visual potential. Every little thing I, get, I can get, I run with it, because you, you can always get more. So always go for it. Protect, 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 protect. Um, understand all the risk factors. So if, if I know my risk, I can manage it. If I don't know my risk, then, then, then I don't know what I'm looking for. And um, 
stop anything from progression if it's not going the way we want it to. So things like cataracts or retinal detachments that are starting. So we can keep the eye for the future because we're out looking for a cure. And these are my references. And I just wanted to say, I can do anything I do without my awesome team. So if you've ever been in my clinic, my nursing staff is the best. So I love this picture of them. Questions? <laughs>